questions for see the screen, okay? Hello, everybody. Thank you all for joining. We should be starting in just a second. Hola a todos. Gracias por estar con nosotros. Vamos a comenzar en un minuto. Gracias por estar con nosotros el día de hoy para este taller. Um, vamos a comenzar en un segundito. Thank you everybody for hopping on for today's webinar. We should be starting in just a, a couple of seconds. Buenos días, buenas tardes. Um, gracias por estar con nosotros el día de hoy. Um, para la, el taller de hoy vamos a tener interpretación disponible en español y en un segundito a nuestra colega Bárbara uh, nos va, a una, nuestra colega Diana nos va a dar un poquito de detalles de cómo ac tener acceso a esa interpretación. Hello everybody, good morning, good afternoon, um, depending on where you are. Um, we just want to remind folks that we do have interpretation in Spanish available for today's webinar. Our colleague uh, Diana will give us instructions on how to access that. Um, Diana, you can go ahead. Hola a todos. Hi everyone. Um, like Abby mentioned, we're going to have interpretation today using the Zoom interpretation function. Como Gaby mencionó, vamos a estar, uh, tener interpretación hoy usando la función de interpretación en Zoom. Um, so if you, um, if you're joining us from your phone or if from your computer, you can see at the bottom left of the once we turn on the interpretation function on, you will see in the bottom right um, a globe, an icon with a globe icon that you can click on and choose your language to English. Um, y como pueden ver, en la, si no están, in, están con nosotros con su computadora, van a, cuando presemos la interpretación, van a ver el, abajo en su pantalla un icono de globo que pueden hacer clic y escoger su idioma al español. Uh, y poner OK. Uh, if you're joining us from your phone, you will see three little dots at the bottom right. And you can choose interpretation and choose English on there. Si estás eh, con nosotros por tu teléfono, nos puede, puedes acceder a la función de interpretación a los tres puntitos de abajo en tu pantalla, hacerle clic y vas a encontrar lo que dice interpretación de idiomas y hacerle clic a español. Entonces, ya cuando termine esta presenta esta introducción, vamos a empezar la, la función de interpretación y, y van a ver el icono del globo. Um, also, just to note that we are, uh, we, the, both Spanish and English are colonized languages, and there are many other languages that are not here present with us. So just being mindful that there might be other languages that are not here represented. También quiero decir que um, los dos, ambos, los dos lenguajes de inglés y español son idiomas de los colonizadores y estamos uh, conscientes de que hay otros idiomas aquí que no están representados. Entonces, ya, yeah, eso es todo. Que tengan una buena reunión. Gracias, Diana. Gracias, Bárbara, por apoyarnos en uh, crear este espacio de una manera uh, multilingüe en inglés y en español. Y como mencionó Diana, reconocemos que hay otros idiomas. 
estamos haciendo una prueba para asegurar de que puedan escuchar interpretación. Nos pueden dejar saber en el chat si están escuchando la interpretación. Right now, we're doing the test. If, we, if folks can drop in the chat, if you can hear the interpretation happening, let us know if it's working. All right. Great. Great. So thank you all. Um, and so we're, we, can, we can go ahead and move forward with the rest of the webinar. Again, thank you all for, thank you Diana and Barbara for helping us create this space. Um, so we want to invite everybody. Um, we're really excited to have you all today. We initially started off thinking about this webinar as a smaller interactive space and you know, folks were showed their interest and the registration definitely soared. So we've been able to adjust to uh, making this available now in webinar mode, uh, which limits the amount of interaction that we have with you all. Um, so uh, to start off, we do, uh, we would love to see who is on today. So if you can introduce yourself in the chat, we're asking folks to introduce yourself um, with your name, pronouns, if you are aware of the closest detention center in your area, um, let us know uh, what detention center that is. And if you are a mental health provider, also let us know. So we're seeing some folks uh, pop in the chat. Uh, we currently have over 70 people on the chat, uh, on the webinar. So thank you all for being present with us today. Again, please introduce yourself in the chat and it's great to see people from Texas, people from Arizona. Who else do we have in the space? Texas and Arizona is heavy today. Virginia. New York, Guatemala. California, Washington. Thank you all to everybody who is introducing themselves into the chat. It's really great to see that you're here, that you're present um, as we cover today's section around Detention 101. Thank you. So we have Georgia, Mexico, California, New York. All right, so with that, I would love to pass it on to uh, our colega Francisca to talk to us about the Latinx Therapist Action Network. Um, um, Francisca approached us for this session specifically for um, their network and graciously opened it up to folks beyond. So Francisca. Gracias, Gaby. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Francisca Porchas Coronado. I um, live in Phoenix, Arizona, and been working uh, there for a long time now. I'm an immigrant from Mexico, and I'm also the founder and director of the Latinx Therapist Action Network. Um, I just want to share a little bit about who we are. Um, we are we're about almost two years old, um, but a, much older in sort of the the conception of it. Um, who we are is we are a network of, we're a network and an online platform of mental health, uh, composed mostly of mental health practitioners, Latinx people across the country. We are in 26 states. There's almost 100 folks in the network who are committed to uh, affirming, uplifting, um, and building the dignity of the migrant rights movement through many different forms, but through centering healing mainly um, and politicized healing of that. We believe in healing justice. We also believe in abolishing ICE and ending detention. And um, we'll share a little bit more about what the work looks like on the ground and the kind of work that we are doing with the immigrant rights movement across the country. What I can say is that um, we're super excited to be uh, a, a member of the Detention Watch Network, um, that this webinar is happening, and that um, many of you who are out there may be new to this fight, um, and many of you who are mental health practitioners, Latinx 
people who are mental health practitioners who are interested in joining the fight, welcome. I'm super excited that you're here. Um, and there'll be more opportunity, again, for me to share more about what we do. Um, mainly, this session is for us to build, continue to build the consciousness of mental health practitioners, health practitioners, healers out there who I think um, are uh, really looking for what role they can play in this movement and also the kind of work, healing work, politicized healing work that they can do with communities. Um, and for us, um, healing has to uh, build or rebuild a sense of justice. And so for us, uh, this is really important um, and we're excited that you're here. Thank you. Gracias, Francisca. Um, so again, we're really excited to be able to, to continue to work in collaboration with the Latinx Therapist Action Network and the very critical work that they're really making and paving the way for. Um, I want to introduce uh, the DWN team that's on, on today as well. Um, my name is Gabriela Marquez Benitez. I uh, use she, her pronouns, and I am based out of Chicago, Illinois. Um, and I'm part of the membership team. And I want if Marcela can introduce herself as well. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Marcela. I'm a senior organizer with the Tension Watch Network based out of California. Pronouns she, her, ella, and really great to share space with you all and looking forward um, to hopefully many of you joining, joining our fight. Thank you for being here. Gracias, Marcela. So, to share a little bit about the Tension Watch Network, uh, where for folks who are, I know we have a lot of our members on today as well, um, but the Tension Watch Network is a national coalition that um, really focuses on building power in a three-pronged strategy um, on the advocacy front, on the grassroots organizing front, and through strategic communications and shifting the narrative. Um, and all of these three are working in conjunction for our vision to abolish the immigration detention in the United States. Um, DWN has been around since 1997 and it is a space both of individuals and of organizations. Currently we have over 130 organizations from across the country that are working on anti-detention efforts in one way or another. Um, and throughout a very wide spectrum of folks from and disciplines from legal service providers to grassroots organizations, uh, policy, and of course, people um, that are directly impacted by detention. That includes formerly detained folks, currently detained folks and their families. Um, and I do want to name and throughout this presentation, we will see sort of like our current vision, but you know, also it's important to name how we have gotten to that point. Um, and although DWN has been um, around uh, loosely and later on to, to the uh, network that we are, um, it wasn't until 2013 that the coalition um, fully updated our vision to really call ourselves to be abolitionist and an abolitionist organization and to really push um, uh, a name, our vision for a world, a world without detention. And so um, throughout uh, today's session, we'll see a little bit of like how that has come about. But um, there is an article that came out just recently from our executive director, Silky Shaw on The Forge that covers a little bit about those lessons learned in the immigrant rights movement and how it's very important that we incorporate abolition into our work. Um, we will be sharing that article for you all to see as well, but uh, thank you, we can move forward. Um, so for today, a little bit about what we'll be covering is, is a lot <laughs> and we'll be trying to condense it in a 90 minute web all right. Um, so we do want to uh, uh, really ground ourselves on, on, on the history of how we've gotten to the place of where the detention machinery now stands. Um, who are the folks, who is our community that is impacted and in what way um, um, try to 
uh, unravel the machinery itself in terms of um, the many components of, of, of the dragnet to detention and to deportation. Um, and it's important also to name the most recent uh, shifts, particularly under our under the last administration and under our current administration um, and what that holds. And we want to dig deep into a little bit, not just on conditions within detention, but really how that had, how, um, what that looks like currently and what organizing from the inside looks, how our communities can engage and support people detained and more specifically the role of health, mental health practitioners. Um, so that is what we will ideally try to cover today. And for the webinar, we do ask that if you have a question on anything that we're covering to drop it in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And that way we'll try to answer it as we go. Uh, so if you have questions, type those on the Q&A box. Um, if you have comments or resources or any other pieces that you would like to share with the rest of the audience, drop that in the chat. Um, and if you have any issues on the tech front or with interpretation, also feel free to drop that in the chat or message me directly. All right, so then I think we're good to go ahead. And um, with that, we wanna, again, talk a little bit of like, what is the history and that, that has allowed for the machinery that we currently see um, be. And I just want to hold a little bit of this slide um, um, for you all to, to, to review. Um, when we talk about immigrant detention, for the most part, folks sort of like hold it on a vacuum in, in, in the last 10 years or so. But it's, it really goes beyond that. And we acknowledge that even you can, you can look at um, how people are caged, have been caged throughout history, right? Um, but for recent history, we wanted to um, mark these particular points down. One is that in the early 80s, we started seeing the first um, um, private detention center and Chrome detention uh, in Florida um, as a response to Cuban Haitian refugees uh, migrating. Um, we also saw again the start of like these the the private prison companies and their greed in terms of wanting to um, expand the cages and their and, and, and really showing their interest of, of profit to detain and cage um, individuals. Um, we later saw that in eighty eight. Um, mandatory detention becomes law. That means if you fall in a particular category, it is mandated that you are detained. Um, and it's, it's, it's very difficult to get people out in, that, in those situations. We also see this aggravated felony um, term come about, um, which is really much a very overall blanket term that um, justifies um, uh, the detention of our community members. Um, and we also see the passing of uh, particular pieces of legislation, particularly anti-terrorism and effective uh, Death Penalty Act, or um, as well as IRA IRA, also known as uh, the Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigrant Responsibility Act. So 96, you may you may be hearing is is again very a very key piece in terms of again um, what further expands the 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 population and community um, that is. Uh, caged. And then after after September 11th, we see that in 2002, DHS is created. Um, so when we say abolish ICE, we talk about um, how there has been a world without ICE. Um, and, 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 and after 20, 2002, um, it's pretty much a lot of that history that we've seen. So I think just in these particular dates, it's important to point out that the system is racist by design, right? Um, 
and that anti-Blackness fuels immigrant uh, detention and immigration enforcement. And from, from this particular piece on in 82, up until more recently, the Biden administration has also been, um, uh, has specifically been targeting Black immigrants uh, for detention and deportation. And when we talk about detention, it's also important that we recognize that it is in conjunction um, to the private industrial complex. Um, and as the private industrial complex has grown, we've also seen that grow in parallel when it comes to immigrant detention. And so speaking of 96, we can go on to the next slide. And in 96, just want to talk a little bit more about these particular points. Um, one, with these with Ira Ira and um, the anti um, um, Anti-Terrorism uh, Death Penalty Act, uh, we see that there are more offenses that folks are um, uh, get tacked on for deportation. We see again, this definition of aggravated felony comes up and it continues to expand. We see mandatory detention happen, mandatory deportation happen. And again, um, there's this, this shift between folks who are residents non-residents, uh, citizens, non-citizens happen. And in terms of how enforcement happens, uh, it happens in, in a very um, uh, intense way in our communities, right? We see that, that terrorism show up in our communities, one, through polimigra or through the immigration system in which um, uh, immigrants are criminalized by agencies at all levels, at the federal, at the state, at the local level, where uh, um, poli police and immigration kind of work hand in hand. And we also see the funds that are given to the organizations, um, to, to these agencies that allow for this machinery to continue. And by funds, we mean a lot. Right, so $25 billion each year go to ICE and to CBP. We'll cover a little bit more about that, but it's really important to name that Congress is, is again, you know, um, uh, uh, funding uh, the existence of these machinery and the growth, the continued growth of these machinery. And yeah, I think we can go on to the next slide. And so when we see, we can see it here very visibly how detention just gross, right? Um, and so the numbers were well under um, um, in, in the early 90s. And then obviously as, um, as DHS is created and ISIS uh, becomes a part of DHS along with uh, Border Patrol, we see that number continue to rise. And in 2019, we had the highest number of people detained um, I do want to name that this chart stops in 2019. Um, in 2020, um, we are in a very particular moment and my colleague Marcela can talk about that, but in 2020, the average um, um, population of people detained dropped to 16,626 people, um, which is the lowest number that we have seen, right? And that doesn't mean that it's good, right? There's a reason why that is happening. Um, we know that Trump had several uh, executive orders that allowed for that to happen. Uh, the border closed, the MPP program at which detained people outside of, um, of the US. And also I want to name that these numbers do not include um, people on ankle shackles or what are known as alternatives to detention. Um, so um, this number can be and has been even larger. In 2017, we knew that over 100,000 people um, were in some sort of detention, which includes ankle shackles. So we can go on to the next slide. And just to cover briefly, um, who are the folks who are at risk of being detained and being deported? Um, I, I think it's important to name that both documented and undocumented folks are at risk of deportation. Um, and by documented, if you hold a green card, if you're an asylee, a refugee, if you have TPS, if you're some sort of a visa holder, um, uh, those folks are still at risk. Uh, a work permit 
is um, not does not signify status, and that still put, puts people at risk. Um, and folks who are undocumented, you know, we we the, uh, are usually the folks that that come uh, to mind. Again, folks who cross the border, uh, whose uh, documentation may have expired, such as their visas, um, or who have an active deportation order. Uh, and also to name that specifically for for documented immigrants and also for undocumented there's another aspect to keep in mind and that includes databases like the gang databases that a lot of our communities are um a part of and that um is just another part of the dragnet um that um puts folks at risk and we know that those are failed systems and racist systems that target particularly black and brown communities the next slide. And um, on this end, um, when we think about who detains, uh, who detains our community, uh, we usually think about ICE and the interior enforcement, right? So Immigration and Customs Enforcement focuses on the, on the interior. Um, uh, and so that's usually what we see in our communities. We know CBP is focused in the borders and anything out, um, uh, within 100 miles from the border um, all throughout. And both ICE and CBP are a part of DHS. Again, DHS um, was created in 2002. And within DHS, both ICE and CBP um, are the most um, well-funded um, or heavily funded uh, immigration enforcement uh, agencies. And so the, the federal government spends more on immigration enforcement than they do on all other um, enforcement agencies combined. So when you think about the FBI, when you think about um, uh, uh, Secret Service, everything combined, ICE and CBP have more funds. Um, and ICE is the largest police force in the country, right? So it's important that we kind of keep that in mind. Um, other agencies, and I know a lot of folks are in the chat uh, had mentioned this earlier, but um, include Health and Human Services. So that also includes ORR or the Office of Refugee Resettlement, uh, the Department of Justice. So in this particular place, the US Marshal Service or Bureau of Prison Systems. And we also know that the Department of Defense um, uh, uh, plays a part within. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, I think we're going to wrap up my part with talking a little bit about how um, immigration um, and what points, what are those trigger sites where our community uh, can be detained? Um, and that includes anything from borders to airports, um, anytime um, that uh, folks are trying to apply for immigration benefits, that is a risk. Um, and it all depends on each person, right? And each person's uh, 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 situation, that can be a risk. Uh, we know of folks, um, at the DMV have been detained. Um, we know folks in public transportation and companies. I know Greyhound has put out a statement recently, but these are places where our communities have also been detained. Um, and in the news, we know and we hear and we see of AIDS happening both in homes, at work, in the streets, and um, as well as and supported, and, and Marcela will touch a lot more on this in the, in the criminal injustice system. And so any any sort of contact with police or some sort of law enforcement agency will, can, um, can trigger uh, detention and possibly deportation. So with that, I'll go ahead and pass it on to my colleague Marcela to talk a little bit about what that can look like. Thank you, Gabby, for taking us um, over that. I'm just checking if there's any um, questions at this point so that we can address those on the chat. Let me see. Okay, I think, yeah, we are good to move. And again, like uh, Gabby said, if you all have any questions that come up, we encourage folks to type them on the chat. Um, and we can start answering some of those and we will have a big space at the end uh, for question and answer as well. Okay. Let me, let's see. There, are you able to see the presentation now? Yes. 
Okay, great. Yes, like Gabby, uh, so just to continue from uh, what Gabby was saying, we're gonna dive a little bit deeper into um, the detention system, the conditions, and how, right, like the, this pipeline, uh, like Gabby mentioned, we do see detention and deportation as being part of the, uh, you know, prison industrial complex. Uh, here you all can see a graphic on just, you know, how folks go, could go into um, the uh, arrest to detention to deportation uh, pipeline. So we see folks being arrested, um, being put in some kind of detention and either deported right away um, or, you know, if they're able to fight their case, uh, they're able, uh, they can go up with an immigration judge and some folks uh, are able to ask for a bond or a purple, something that's called purple from ICE. I just have to say it's it's really hard for folks uh, to get bond or we've been seeing how they're like, how judges have been uh, giving folks really high bonds. And some of this has been because of laws that have been enacted to also right, continue to keep folks longer in detention and to push them to even sell the poor. So we do see this detention um, as a, a violent uh, space um, to continue to perpetuate violence against the immigrant community. And yeah, uh, we see a lot of folks getting stuck in detention, uh, fighting their case. Um, and so either if they get a bond or not, they continue to fight their case uh, through immigration court to see if they're eligible for, for any relief. Um, and then if folks um, don't win uh, their case uh, through uh, the first uh, hearing, uh, some folks uh, go uh, to appeal. And again, um, it's the immigration law, it's very complex. And there is a reason why it's very complex, right? It's really hard for, for folks to actually um, navigate the system uh, without attorneys. And also attorneys are very expensive. Um, and it's, it's, there's not a lot of, uh, you know, pro bono services that are available. So really it's, it's a system that discourages people um for for fighting to to stay here and that puts them in that system in the first place so here's the uh, also in spanish um and then also uh we want to talk a little bit more about how um immigration ha is is also really um impacted with this entanglement with the criminal punishment system so here we also see just this graphic of how uh, folks are criminalized and go right through the criminal punishment system. In the next slide, we'll see how uh, police and ICE, uh, there's a lot of police and ICE entanglement through this process as well. So we already know this criminal punishment system um, is racist and unjust by design. And then we see it's entanglement um, through it. So I'll go to the next slide. So here, right, we see that uh, when commun immigrant communities uh, get racially profiled and arrested by police or criminalized, uh, they're having programs nationally pushed. And some of you might have these programs in your communities or have actually fought against these programs in your communities, like 287G, right, where officers, uh, where police can act as ICE uh, to target immigrants. Um, they can also uh, check databases uh, to see if folks, um, you know, are undocumented. And they can qu question people about their immigration status. We also see uh, secure communities uh, that can go into effect when somebody's booked into a jail. And again, like if, you know, the uh, police doesn't act as ICE itself when they're booked, folks can be interviewed about their immigration status without having um, an attorney present. So a lot of folks are pushed uh, to rebuild their immigration status so they can already you know, uh, put a flag on them to start their de uh, deportation proceedings. And there's also um, other, other programs like CAP. Where, and then if folks actually get to go through, you know, trying to get out of, 
jail after being arrested, there's something called a hold that they can put on them so that ICE knows to be waiting for them when they are done going through uh, these proceedings. And then again, like fo folks can be interviewed at uh, any point when they're going through the criminal punishment system. And, you know, some folks uh, complete their sentences um, and what we're seeing right now a lot and we haven't seen for years um, is that when folks are completing their sentences or even under COVID, where a lot of folks um, have been fighting for releases from folks from jails and prisons, you know, ICE uh, is there, like there's data that's shared with ICE uh, so that ICE can pick them up when they're being released. So we're seeing this, that they go from one cage to another. And I know a lot of folks nationally has, have also been calling and then to jail, prison, to ICE transfers. And here's the graphic in Spanish. And we'll share this recording for folks. Um, so because of this, we, you know, we wanna continue doing more education about how um, detention and deportation are part of the personal industrial complex and how police and ICE are very entangled. So we have created this resource called Defund Races Law Enforcement, Police, ICE and CVP. Uh, so we'll also share that with folks uh, because, you know, we as, as we are calling uh, for defunding ICE, abolish ICE, defunding CVP, we also want to. We also acknowledge that it's important for us to support the movements to defund the police. Okay, and now I'll go more into like what did we what shifts that we see under the last presidency, and again, like Gabby mentioned, um, part of this is that we want to let people know that Trump inherited a system that you know was already very well designed to detain and deport our communities. Um, and then he just used that system, right, to uh, continue to target even more our communities for detention and deportation. So under Trump, we actually saw that there was 24 expansion proposals that were put out um, to expand detention. And we saw that he, uh, under Trump, there was fund, funding for ICE detention um, was increased to uh, about 50,000 uh, 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 detention beds. And part of a lot of what uh, Detention Watch Network has been doing is tracking these proposals and see uh, supporting our members that are on the ground or if other communities uh, want, were organizing against these expansions, we provided technical support um, to help them organize against these expansions and fight these expansions. Also under Trump, um, you know, we saw that there was up to 221 jails that were used for detention. And again, these are facilities that are just solely to detain immigrants or there were uh, contracts between the local sheriffs to use part of uh, county jails. And this also right, included family detention. And we also saw that Trump rolled back uh, some policies um, that had been in place for years or under Trump to really target more folks, uh, like folks seeking asylum. Um, and also, right, there was, ICE has never been transparent. Uh, and under Trump, it was even harder to know what was happening inside um, of detention and it really decreased transparency. We also saw faster deportations and longer stays. We have seen, even on like, under Trump and before Trump, we have seen some folks that have been in detention for five years, right? Because they, they are fighting their case. Like if, if they are deported, um, that could mean death for them. Um, so a lot of folks, um, or, or sometimes uh, the US because of different foreign treaties that they have, they can deport certain folks back to their country. So folks are stuck in detention. So we have seen um, some folks, specifically black immigrants being in detention up to uh, five years. Uh, we also continue to see a push from the entanglement of immigration um, and the criminal punishment system and police. And like Gabby had mentioned, we saw the detention budget explode to three billion annually, um, and again to uh, 25 billion uh, for ICE and CVP. And also to name, uh, like Gabby alluded to earlier, 
81% of uh, the facilities uh, of detention is operated by private companies. Uh, we're not saying that private detention centers are worse than um, those that are run by, for example, local entities like the sheriffs or the federal government. Uh, and we think, yeah, and we know that both, both uh, privately run and publicly run have uh, pervasive financial incentives, but there are this uh, companies like GEO and CoreCivic that are constantly lobbying for more detention and you know, that are making money out of the suffering um, of incarcerating immigrants. And what are we seeing now under Biden? Um, so actually, uh, because of our efforts uh, through one of our campaigns called Defund Hate, uh, we, we did see that uh, funding for detention beds in uh, the fiscal year 21 was reduced to 34,000 from fiscal year 20, which uh, was uh, uh, given 40, uh, funding for 45, uh, 250 beds. Again, under Trump, um, they still managed to fill more beds. Um, and also this fund, this reduction, it was nowhere near our demand, right? Uh, like Gabby mentioned, because of COVID and the government closing the border. Um, and unfortunately, because they kept deporting people, um, right? And because of some of the efforts that we were able, uh, local communities were able to see some releases, uh, we, we were really demanding that they uh, cut the funding for detention this way more. Um, given that there's about 14,000 people in detention right now. Um, unfortunately, under Biden, we continue to see deportations. As you, as you all know, there was a moratorium on deportations that was announced. However, uh, Texas uh, sued that uh, executive order and now it's stuck in the courts. Although we know Biden can still do much more and we're pushing him um, to do everything in his power to continue to stop deportations. We, as of uh, February 16, we have seen over 26,000 deportations. Uh, this is an estimate by one of our partners, uh, United We Dream, and disproportionately, we see an impact on black immigrants, right? Um, there's been about 1,300 asylum seekers deported to Haiti, about 19 deportation flights to Haiti, while uh, Haiti is experiencing a lot of po uh, uh, political unrest and crisis. And, you know, folks, folks are, are fighting in Haiti for their rights. And also, um, under Biden, what we are unfortunately seeing is that as we have, some folks have been pushing an end to family detention, Instead, we are seeing that he is rebanding Texas family detention centers to so-called reception centers. Um, and that is not what we're demanding. Uh, we can also share uh, some of, an article that uh, our members and the press release that our members have written that, you know, any, um, a cage is a cage and any time in ICE um, could be very, very dangerous. And also we are seeing that actually the Biden administration is considering turning Burks, another family detention in Pennsylvania into an adult detention center. And so I know folks uh, are joining us from all over the place on this call. So I just wanna show this map uh, for you all to get a sense of where are these detention centers located and we see that, yeah, almost every state in, in the nation um, has a, at least one or multiple detention centers. Um, and we'll go into like, how, what are we doing, right, to fight against, for these detention centers to be shut down and against expansion. So now I'm gonna go a little bit more. Um, that was a, a kind of like an overview of the detention system and how folks end up in detention. So now I'm gonna, um, talk a little bit more about the conditions, which is just horrific uh, conditions that many of you all have heard of. Um, but just to name, you know, detention is deadly. Over 200 people have died in detention since 2004. Uh, fiscal year 2020 was actually one of the deadliest uh, with 21 deaths. So, you know, detention was already uh, violent and very bad. Um, before COVID and we just saw, you know, that getting worse under COVID. 
and some of the gracious violations that we have um, witnessed in detention are medical neglect, inadequate to no medical and mental health care, use of solitary confinement, uh, which internationally is seen as torture, physical, verbal, mental, um, and emotional abuse, sexual right, assault as well, sexual abuse, no outdoor recreation, restrictions on, on visitations, just very uh, horrible food. Uh, folks, um, you know, are pushed to work for a dollar a day in, inside of detention. And some of, you know, there's even a lawsuit around that in, in Washington state. And so for us, you know, we're not pushing for better conditions. We're pushing for, um, for these detention centers to, to be shut down. And so I wanna go into some, um, dive into some examples of what we're seeing in different detention centers across the nation. Uh, so for example, in Berks, which is a family detention center, um, right, we have seen uh, that, you know, children are very impacted. Uh, there's verbal and sexual abuse uh, that has happened here. Guards, you know, have ignored instances of when folks have gotten, uh, families have gotten fever, uh, you know, respiratory illnesses. They just ignore a lot of uh, the request uh, to have medical treatment. Um, and there have been numerous studies that have shown how uh, families are psychologically affected um, by being in these detention centers and even leading to PTSD. Uh, emotional and mental health issues and, and other physical and emotional behavioral health problems and challenges. So we have also seen that folks actually uh, health, mental health and physical health has gotten worse uh, once they have been in, in detention. Um, this is another uh, detention center where there a lot of our members have been organizing to, to shut it down for years. And probably some of you heard uh, about what uh, happened at Irwin Detention Center in Georgia. Um, so folks have been, you know, made to work for a dollar a day there. And also uh, recently 40 women um, uh, did a lawsuit against ICE, you know, because gynecologists uh, uh, were performing hysterectomies against their will. So I think, you know, a lot of folks saw this in the news. And, they, you know, this was a new law for ICE. And unfortunately, something, um, a lot of the, the abuses that, that were recorded in this lawsuit are things that we have seen um, in across other detention centers. And also they uh, share about the lack of COVID-19 precautions um, that, that were happening there, which we saw all across the nation. And we can share more, more of that information with you all that complaint and lawsuit um, and some more, more of the details that the women were sharing there. Um, and it was right thanks to a, whistle, a nurse whistleblower that also supported um, them uh, coming out and, and sharing that. And unfortunately, um, we saw that some of, uh, some of the women were deported um, because they sh in, in retaliation to sharing their stories. Uh, for And then another uh, one that we want to share is what we're seeing at Adelanto uh, Detention Center, which is located in California. Um, so between 2010 and 2016, Adelanto was in the top five facilities with the most complaints um, to ICE reporting uh, sexual and physical abuse. So seven immigrant, uh, immigrants have died at the facility since it opened in, in just uh, 2017, three people uh, died within three months, and there has been at least uh, seven recorded attempted suicides there. Also, some of you all might have heard, um, you know, under COVID, as we were pushing for releases of folks, what uh, Gio and I decided to do uh, to say that they could still continue to incarcerate folks is that they were using toxic chemicals to disinfect inside the facilities during the pandemic. And because there's no ventilation inside, this caused people to develop bloody noses, burning eyes and coughing. 
Um, so they were saying that they were taking steps um, to manage COVID inside and we know that 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 was a lie and instead we saw uh, folks inside be really affected by this toxic chemicals they were using um, to clean. Um, and in, in a form, you know, uh, we, we have also seen in Adelanto a lot of hunger strikes. Um, and we also see that there's a lot of retaliation that is used against folks that are doing hunger strikes inside of detention. And I'll go more into that in a bit. Um, but also I wanna just share with folks um, this complaint that Raices and Haitian Bridge Alliance uh, recently did around pregnant people in detention. So if you see this graphics, it shows um, about the numbers of pregnant women in ICE detention uh, in 2016, 2017, 2018, and how they have increased. And also that the majority of pregnant women detained are Black. 79% uh, um, are current uh, family detention center. And here we, we see um, two examples of, how, of the abuse against pregnant people um, in a current detention center of, you know, folks uh, suffering miscarriages. And just we have heard so many horrible stories uh, about how uh, pregnant people are treated in detention. So this is uh, specific to Carnes and specific to, um, you know, uh, black women and uh, which we see are, are the majority that are detained in Carnes. So again, like Gabby have mentioned, we see how black immigrants really are the most impacted by detention and deportation. So a lot of these policies are anti-black, they're, they're xenophobic. Uh, another uh, report that came out that we can also share the link to is by um, one of our members as well, um, AF, uh, AFSC, and it's entitled Pregnant Immigrants and Asylum Seekers During COVID-19. So they specifically go more into the treatment uh, from CDP and ICE under the pandemic. Um, and yeah, again, they have just uh, documented horrific accounts of pregnant people who have been mistreated in ICE custody, denied medical treatment while in labor, and forcefully expelled them to unsafe locations in Mexico after just giving birth. So it's just really horrific. Uh, conditions that really impact um, our immigrant community, you know, a lot. Um, and just, again, um, we see that Black immigrants are much likely than uh, other folks to be deported. Um, and also, right, because we see that there ha um, Black communities are, um, you know, very criminalized in the U.S. Uh, more than one out of every five non-citizens that's facing deportation uh, due to contact uh, with the criminal punishment system or due to previous convictions is Black. We have seen uh, Black communities uh, spend longer times in detention. And as I mentioned before, we have seen them be really targeted uh, for deportation under Biden. And we also right, um, see how trans immigrants are also uh, a, another group that um, suffer and you know, are very impacted uh, for detention. So specifically um, for trans immigrants, right, we have also seen that there's high levels of sexual assault and they're routinely harassed by guards. Um, sometimes they are kept indefinitely in uh, isolation and solitary confinement because they're trans. They're subjected to abusive strips. Um, and also there's no access to necessary medical services, including hormone therapy or have faced harmful interruptions or restrictions uh, to that care. And Human Rights Watch has um, some good information. And then there's also a lot of groups um, like Transatina Coalition uh, or Familia that are, uh, you know, leading campaigns against ending trans detention. And even uh, through all of this, right, we, we are resisting. Um, this is why um, it's, it's really important that we continue to fight to abolish immigrant detention and abolish ICE 
So first of all, I want to center the resistance that is happening inside of the detention centers uh, led by people that are currently detained. Um, so in um, a lot of our members give a lot of support uh, to hunger strikers and to center their demands and to center um, their calls uh, to get released and for these detention centers to be shut down. So from March to July 2020, uh, we recorded that nearly 2,500 people joined over 50 hunger strikes uh, in detention centers across the nation. Um, and that is only hunger strikes. Um, we also saw folks doing work stoppages, sit-ins, recording videos, sending demand letters uh, to elected officials. Um, so the conditions were so so horrible, right? Um, that push that folks have been pushed to use any tool at their disposal to, to call for their freedom, um, including hunger strikes. And um, as CWN, um, we have two main campaigns on how we're fighting against um, all of these horrible conditions and to end immigrant detention. One of them is our Communities Not Cages campaign. Uh, so for this campaign, um, we support our members in stopping the expansion of detention centers, in starting uh, campaigns to shut down facilities, um, and a lot of folks, you know, even before they joined EWN, a lot of folks have already been having these campaigns locally to shut down the local facility um, and also to stop ICE uh, to, you know, uh, go into other agencies. And right now, um, there's about, there's um, probably more than 23 local campaigns across the nation calling for the shutdown of the local facilities under COVID, right, uh, with uh, following the direction of our local members. We also um, continue to call for freedom all efforts. So there's about 37, uh, more than 37 efforts across the nation um, calling for the release of folks at their local detention center. And for freedom all right, we, we wanna continue to through this demand even post COVID because as uh, facilities are shutting down, we don't want folks to just get transferred, we actually want them to be released. Um, and even under uh, Trump on 2021, we our members actually prevented two new deten uh, cent detention centers for be from being open, one in Illinois and one in Wyoming. Um, so in, in Oregon, our members there uh, were actually able to end the contract with ICE and their local jail. And also uh, many of our members are pushing for state legislation to not allow more um, immigrant detention in their state and to phase out detention, such as in California. I know we saw the passage of SB 29 and AB 32. Um, and right now there's uh, four states that are pushing anti-detention legislation. Um, in their state. Uh, so that is something that we also support our members with. Um, and if folks want to get connected to those efforts, I know in, it's in Maryland, New Jersey, uh, Washington, and New Mexico, where those efforts are taking place. Let us, uh, we can also send you that information. And then we also have our uh, defund hate campaign. So this is um, our campaign that we're through the appropriation process where we are fighting to take money away from ICE and CVP and also asking right for that money to be invested in, in the community services that our uh, communities, in services that our communities need. Uh, so we're calling for dramatic cuts to funding to DHS, uh, focusing also on you know, cutting uh, for CVP and no more funding that goes into wall construction, uh, cuts for agents, cut for detention beds. Um, and we're gonna start uh, ramping up a lot of our advocacy around the budget uh, already. So if folks are interested in, in being part, even if it's just you know, to send an email to your elected official um, or just to uh, schedule a meeting with them, to see where they stand on defund hate and asking them to, to support our defund hate demands. Um, this year we're asking uh, Congress to cut the detention budget by 75%. Um, and our goal is 
that they completely defund detention in the next two years. Yeah, and then I'll uh, stop there. I know that was a lot of information. Um, and I'll pass it on to actually Francisca to say, how can, uh, if you're a health protectioner, how can you get involved in this efforts to abolish detention, abolish ICE? Hi, everybody. <laughs> Um, thank you. I actually um, uh, want to acknowledge uh, somebody who's part of our team. Uh, her name is Diana Perez Ramirez. Um, I don't know if I know she's translating right now, so I know she can't formally uh, introduce herself, but um, yeah, so I just wanted to name uh, that she's an important part of our team and also has is the coordinator, is the national coordinator, and right now is translating and translating the the slideshow as well. So I don't know, Diana, si puedes poner tu cámara. Uh, Diana, if you can turn your camera on, just to wave. <laughs> uh, Diana is a midwife in training and then also just has been part of this movement for a very long time, um, Phoenix, Arizona based. Um, thank you so much, uh, Marcela and Gabi. Um, that was a lot of information and you all, um, <laughs> compacted it a lot and also inspired, I hope, a lot of people that are on this call to plug into movement, to also, um, you know, figure out in their role where they are, ways in which they can, um, you know, stand up against detention um, or support some of the calls to action that um, Detention Watch Network puts out. So we can share Detention Watch Network's um, website um, on the chat um, so that you all can follow and sign up for updates and all that good stuff. Although I think registration asked you all for that. So I think given everything we've heard, I um, just wanted to again affirm um, what the network is and why we are so deeply invested in also ending detention and following the lead of Detention Watch Network and the, the lead of the movement um, across the country um, to end detention, free them all, to abolish ICE. Um, the network um, primarily does um, a few things. One is we're creating mental health education for those in the front lines of this movement. So that could look in many ways if you become a member as a mental health practitioner or a student of the mental health field, somebody in um, academics. Um, that looks like workshops, webinars like this one, ways in which we can skill up the movement emotionally, spiritually, um, uh, a lot of the skills that our folks already have, Latinx mental health practitioners who've been trained, experience that they have working community and ways to share. The second thing is we are ongoingly politicizing um, mental health practitioners and those in the mental health field from our community. There are not many Latino, Latina, Latinx people who are mental health practitioners. And the more specific that it then it gets, the smaller that it gets, whether it's um, Afro Latinos or Black Latinos, whether that is, um, you know, indigenous, more indigenous Latinos, whether there's immigrant Latinos, uh, Latinas, Latinx people. And so it's just important to name that um, we see folks in the mental health field from our community as a really amazing and precious resource. And we also see the movement as a very precious and amazing resource, people that are putting their bodies on the line. So that being said, we're here to hold up their, their sort of, um, you know, here to support and, and provide tools for them as much as we can. And that's the role that you all can play. The second thing is, with that being said, we do plug you in with movement organizations that are reaching out to us, asking us for very specific things. We've helped people in this COVID time lead grief circles, um, lead circles around what trauma does in our bodies uh, with specific organizations, depending on what they're going through and what their needs are. The third thing is um, support people inside detention. Um, and that, I don't mean in a clinical way, um, because there's a lot of you know, potential um, licensing sort of issues, but what you can do, you do have skills, you do have experience, um, you do have training to be able to support people emotionally uh, who are either inside of detention centers or the families um, of people inside detention centers who are often in a lot of um, grief 
or crisis. And so whether that is a few emotional support sessions or whether that is trauma first aid, you know, we had masses of people coming in um, or being released from detention, sorry, during the Trump administration and no capacity to be able to really be the sort of first line of folks, of mental health um, providers who could really um, welcome folks and, and help them even just regulate their nervous systems as they were coming out of a very really traumatic experience of migration, but also uh, experience of being inside detention and being pretty much interrogated, abused um, in all kinds of ways inside. And so that's another way. Another way is that we have a directory. We have a directory of Latinx mental health practitioners who are committed to providing accessible, affordable, culturally grounded and politically informed um, mental health services. And so we know that many of our migrant communities don't have access to mental health care. There's a lot of stigma that we have to break through, obviously, but even the access, um, it could be very, very expensive. And so we're giving our folks an opportunity um, to serve through our network and make it uh, more affordable for certain uh, folks reaching out to us or folks in the front lines as well. Um, and I guess the last thing I would say is that there is an opportunity for, for folks in the network to also plug in. Like we do see ourselves as part of this broader fight and we want and will be responding to calls to action constantly. And obviously I, I don't think our members can often be the ones at the front of the protest or at the marches or organizing in the ways that I think Detention Watch Network does and other people on the ground. But there are opportunities to be able to really um, speak on behalf of this of this field, given that um, you know detention centers are places where a lot of medical neglect, as it was um, spoken about, does happen at the hands of many of our people. Um, and I don't think that, um, you know, I don't believe that anybody enters this field believing they're gonna do harm. I think all of our folks enter the field believing they wanna do good and sometimes find themselves in, in very um, tough situations. And so all that to say is that there is an opportunity um, to, um, to be able to, um, repair the harm in some ways and or be a whole sector of mental health practitioners who draw the line and say no we will not cause this kind of harm and we will reform the ways in which mental health has been weaponized and and um, medical um like the physical health like the broader health sector has been weaponized against our people um and so that's what we do why we exist, I just want to say really quickly again for all the reasons that have, have been already put out by the Tension Watch Network. Um, I do want to say though that we believe in healing justice um, as that that the belief in healing justice is as much about our right to well-being as it is about building power. And um, we also recognize that our own ancestral lineages have survived centuries of erasure and confinement and redefinition and that we are here because we are ancestors continued presence and that for us healing justice is about continuing that work and honoring all the resilience that has been built and continuing to intentionally build it through our practice and our role. And, and we are committed again to honoring, you know, the cultural and, and movement building practices that have enabled us to, to really overcome and continue to overcome oppression uh, and build resilience for generations. And, and that we believe in our community's right and ability to heal. Uh, and I think that's at the center of a lot and that we will win, that we will win. And that's why we're a part of Detention Watch Network and that's why we exist. And that's why we see our, our role as very, very unique. And so that being said, I will drop in the chat um, the network's, uh, uh, it's the website and in Spanish and in English. Uh, we have a web, our websites in Spanish and English so you can check out and learn more about us and then obviously learn more about Detention Watch Network as well. Thank you. Thank you, Francisca. Um, and again, um, I know there's, there's folks that might not be um, 
a health uh, protectioner that, that are present here. Um, but definitely how we have also uh, seen uh, health petitioners get involved is, yeah, getting involved with the local fights that exist. Again, uh, we are supporting 23 fights across the nation. Um, so if folks are, are interested in getting connected with their local fight, uh, we'll put our, our email down, uh, our campaign email where you can contact us so we can uh, send you uh, the names of the organizations that are leading those local fights in your region. Um, also, we right, have seen uh, folks uh, yeah, supporting those local fights uh, and uh, supporting hunger strikers, uh, being part of visitation programs, pen pop programs, um, provide expert testimony or evaluations uh, in collaboration with legal service providers. Um, and even under COVID, we saw a lot of folks organizing their own peers and colleagues and organizations as you know, public uh, health providers demanding uh, the release of people in detention. And we continue uh, to organize around Freedom Mall and we continue, uh, yeah, you know, we're gonna continue um, organizing through Communities Not Cages and Defund Hate. So if folks wanna sign up to our action alerts, I put the link on the chat. We really encourage you all to sign up to those. And you know, even if, if you don't have uh, the capacity to be more involved in the things that I had just mentioned, but just you know, taking action by sending an email, making a call that could also go a long way, uh, depending on, on folks' capacity. Uh, it's specifically under communities, not cages, under the Biden administration, we just uh, relaunched that campaign asking Biden to uh, close down 10 detention centers in his first year, first year in office. As you all saw, uh, the funding for detention bans went down. However, we have not see, seen any contracts ended. Um, and uh, among those 10 detention centers, all family detention is included. Um, and also, right, why we want these contracts to actually be ended is because we don't want uh, the rumors of, for example, what, what's the rumors of Berks where, you know, even if Berks as a family detention center is going to be uh, ended, um, the family detention part of it, they want to convert it into an adult detention center. So that is why for us, we, we're really asking for him to end the contract. So um these cages are not you know used for like they're they're not if they you know if if they continue to do enforcement um or as with the reopening the water we don't find we don't want folks uh to be detained and we have also found out that when there is a detention center that is opened up or constructed in in a community we have also seen enforcement ramp up right because if if they build it they want to fill it up um, so this is also why it's, it's important to, for us to continue um, to really advocate for this detention centers to be shut down. But yeah, now we want to open it uh, for question and answer. I am seeing that folks were asking questions throughout the session and thank you, Gabby, for answering them. Um, and yeah, Gabby, I'll pass it on to you to see if, if you see any, any questions or yeah, to moderate that part. Yeah, we've been heavily getting questions about how people can connect with you, Francisca. So we've shared the contact um, website for uh, Latinx Therapist Action Network, but I don't know if there's any other ways that you want to speak on that, your Instagram page or Facebook or any other. Yeah, I'm going to put it on the chat um, so folks have, have that information. And thank you. Similarly, folks are asking, um, how could trained therapists perhaps advise people like uh, Christine, who is an amateur pen pal and pre-COVID uh, used to visit detention in Georgia? Um, how can we do a better volunteer job regarding mental health language, even a list or phrases to use? And I saw you responded, but I don't know if there's anything to that. Yeah, I mean, I, I I don't think I can be, I'm the right person to answer fully the question since I'm not a mental health practitioner. So I would love to connect you to someone. So if you can email me where I just share in the chat so that 
um, yeah, if you need that kind of guidance, I think um, we have folks that can definitely, um, you know, be responsive and share that with you. Thank you. So please uh, contact Francisca directly from the website. Francisca also dropped an email address and you can follow them on social media as well. They're always sharing very helpful resources in English and in Espanol. Um, so those can be available. I think other questions for the most part have been answered. I do wanna highlight, um, uh, let's see, we have a couple of comments. One was from Sophia. Um, Sophia, I, I am a, a human rights advocate for victims um, of violence in Guatemala, and we have an increase of criminalization I was interested in this webinar to find similar action points to accompany people detained. We are still learning the impact of the illegal detention system within the justice system here in Guatemala. So thank you, Sophia. We hope this was helpful. Let us know if there's any questions. And we have uh, Tim who says that in Boston, the contract was ended a couple of years ago between ICE and the sheriff at the Suffolk County of House Correction. So yes, there's a lot of wins, but also it's important as Marcela highlighted it, what happens to these facilities once they're updated out, once contracts are ended, how do we ensure that that does not continue? And for that, we did drop an article with the Forge. We can drop that again in the chat and we will also include as a follow-up for other resources of how your community can engage on that. Uh, Alejandra says, I would say the most impactful way to learn from the network and Francisca has been that as a formerly incarcerated person who's in deportation proceedings and am an organizer, I am too a first responder, responder to my community. I have learned to build and expand my own resilience through their support and practices. And then now I share and can support other people and proceedings that I work with, with the same tools that helped me continue this work. Gracias, Ale. Um, what quick resources do you have on immigrant rights? I've had clients where a family member is detained. Is there something that I can give to these families? Sandra, that's a very broad question. If there's anything in particular that you were looking for, we also will be dropping a membership directory for Detention Watch Network. Um, you can check out who is a member closest to you, and um, I definitely recommend connecting them with the local organization involved in these efforts. Um, Maybe if I may answer one of the questions yeah, that came from the evaluation. So um, somebody, uh, Jacqueline Tobar, um, asked about resources to help um, them understand what to write in Nivala in order to help migrant people. I would say that it is super important to train, get formal training on how to do psych evals. Um, the stakes are so high. Um, I know the movement often um, tries to figure out how to get psych evaluations for our people inside. Um, and I would honestly say that there's a whole sector, um, a whole business that's been made out of where mental health practitioners don't really care about people inside. Um, not that you have to, as a mental health practitioner, inherently be in relationship with the person you're serving, but I, what I would say is that it's become a major moneymaker for a lot of mental health practitioners that don't have any political analysis um, and sometimes are um, also do very poor in practice. So um, I would just encourage anybody out there to please get training i have i can't really comment on how much people are charging for them because i'm not as familiar what i have heard from our own members in places like texas is that there are whole just businesses that are built out in that that are very lucrative which is um concerning uh if that's somewhat a motivating factor uh, to do this work and that we have members in our network who are down to train folks as well and i can connect you with them so that you know you're working with somebody that that is um, aligned politically and, and ethically a follow-up to that is uh francisca how can they go about getting that training um again email me um, so that then I can connect you to the right folks inside our, our membership um, who are trainers. And I just put, I put it on the chat, the email. 
Thank you. And other folks are asking about our recording. Yes, we are recording this webinar. We will follow up with folks who registered um, and we'll send a recording. Uh, it's possible that Latinx Therapist Action Network may have it available on their YouTube page soon. So keep an eye out for that. And in terms of the chat, the chat will definitely come along with the recording that we sent out. So we can have that along with all of the resources of links that we've been sharing throughout this webinar. Um, anything else? <laughs> and, and again, um, you know, if, if folks uh, want to get connected with the local efforts in your state, um, there, there's a lot of efforts in a lot of states, not, not in all states, um, but in a lot of states. Email us uh, to our um, campaign email. We'll send it as a follow-up and we can connect you with the correct organizations. I think, you know, definitely following the lead of the local efforts is really important. Um, if, and also uh, to sign up for our action alerts, we also, or follow us on social media. On social media, we amplify a lot of the calls to action from our members or national calls to action especially now that we have a new administration that, you know, we're, we're pushing to take action around this. Um, so again, like uh, whatever capacity you have, right? Even if it's uh, five minutes in your day or you actually have more capacity to get involved in local efforts, anything is welcome. If you're an organization um, and you're not yet a member of DWN, I also posted um, the link to become a member. Um, we also do uh, individual em uh, membership, or you can also become, um, you know, I encourage you to donate to the local efforts in your state. And also, if you want to um, become more of a donor to DWN, uh, yeah, you know, instead of a member, we also uh, invite, yeah, welcome that. But uh, yeah, I don't know, Gabby, if I'm missing anything on how folks can get plugged in into DWN's efforts or local efforts. To no, I think that's. Lives. That's right. And if you have a, if you do have an organization and would like to sign on to the demand to shut down these first 10, you can still co-sponsor the campaign and do that. Um, we do have one question. Maybe you can answer, Marcela, if you know of any organizations in Southern California looking for pro bono attorneys. So I can let you answer that in the chat. Um, but any, if there are any other questions, please drop them now in the Q&A box. Um, or if you have any comments, it looks like Cindy is also dropping in some resources uh, for Colorado. That's great. If you have any other resources that you also want to share, this is definitely a space to do that in the chat. All right. So with that, we want to thank you all for being on. Um, let's see. Um, I don't know, uh, Francisca, if you have anything, otherwise we can start closing. Just want to say thank you. Thank you to everybody who joined us and thank you to the Detention Watch Network for, for educating us today and for all your amazing work. Thank you so much, uh, Francisca, and thank you everybody for being on today. And we want to encourage you all again to follow Latinx Therapist Action Network on all of their social media platforms. If you can also follow Detention Watch Network on our social media platforms, um, where uh, we'll be sharing updates and opportunities where you can connect with uh, the current efforts as we're pushing the Biden administration to shut down the first 10 uh, detention centers within uh, this first year of the administration. Uh, find ways you can plug in. You can plug in as an individual. You can plug in as an organization. Um, and uh, we will be sending all resources and recording through email. Thank you all for joining. It was great to have you.